All right. So I have here paleontologist Tim James, and he was on episode 49 of Rich Conversations. Where, where are you right now? So I'm in Prescott, Arizona, on the top of a giant hill at a uh, casino. Uh, <laughs> being here uh, on my days off because I've been doing a pretty big archaeological survey just outside of town, um, just west of Prescott in the Prescott National Forest. We've been working for the USDA, been able, able to map some really crazy sites, found some archaic points, found some really amazing rock art, so petroglyphs, you know, etched in, you know, effigies, stuff like that. And uh, yeah, I've also been kind of traveling all over Arizona, uh, networking, developing connections with different scientists here. And uh, yeah, I've just been kind of keeping busy. So yeah, that's, that's me. Yeah, so but the last my- time we talked, so I have, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, I have my dinosaur mug right now uh, with hot coffee. Throughout, throughout the conversation, it will, it will go back. Right now it's a fossil. It's one of those, those mugs that, you put a, something hot in it, then it reveals something. Oh, you know, yeah. like like a like a uh, eight year old who's interested in in dinosaurs, just like cool stuff like that. Oh yeah, something and, you would eighty dollars for at a uh, tourist trap. I love those oh, things totally. Um, so yeah. the last time, so we last time was really interesting because we did it in person, and you were in Chicago visiting, and you were living in South Dakota at the time, and now you're in LA. I am. Yeah. So a lot has transpired since we met at last. I've worked for like five different institutions since then. Um, Just been, you know, that's life. You can never predict where you are going to end up, especially in paleontology. We have a saying in academia. It goes, uh, you know, thrive where planted. So I kind of find myself thrust all over the U.S., but one thing I will say is the weather in Los Angeles and it is a lot better than the weather in South Dakota and the paleontology there is pretty cool. So I've been lucky to get to be a part of that. Um, you know, so who, who, do you, who do you work for now? So it's kind of a, it's kind of a funny question. So I work for like five different organizations, which is just, just a fancy way of saying I'm kind of like, think of me as a paleontology slash archaeology mercenary. Yeah. So yeah. I, oh, yeah. These, I like that. Yeah. So there's all these construction companies and, you know, even the USDA, USDA needs to go map out sites before they have cows graze land and stuff. So I've just been, you know, kind of contracting out with the highest bidder and seeing who is going to pay me the most for my archaeology and paleontology skills. So wow. right now, I've been working for uh, John Mitch and Associates uh, at the Orange County Zoo. I've been monitoring for fossils and artifacts uh, during the construction of their new large mammal exhibit. It's going to be really cool. It's going to have a panther and some, uh, you know, mountain cats and maybe a tiger if we're lucky. Uh, so I've been doing that. I've also been working for uh, SWCA, which is a large environmental consulting firm in Burbank and in, uh, you know, the valley and different parts of the city, you know, working in Crenshaw, looking for mammoths down there. And, you know, and in addition to that, I actually landed some work with the federal government, which is why I'm out here in Arizona. Uh, I'm working for the uh, U.S. Uh, so the Department of Agriculture has a natural resource conservation service. And so I'm kind of uh, working on that uh, team, trying to preserve these artifacts, preserve these, you know, important indigenous histories in, uh, you know, rural Arizona. And some of the stuff we're finding hasn't been seen, you know, by any other white men. It, it's truly, truly amazing work. I feel lucky to get to have done it. <laughs> So let's let's back up here. So for for people listening and watching, when you think of South Dakota, you think, oh yeah, fossils out in nature. Um, of course, there there are these these ancient artifacts out there. But L.A. people think L.A. What do you, what do you mean there are fossils in oh, yeah. L.A. and archaeology? Can you elaborate on on the archaeological significance of L.A. Yeah, so people have, you know, very little understanding of the history of Los Angeles because a lot of that city has been built in the last 80 years. 
So there's actually people who are still alive who remember Compton and Crenshaw and all the Baldwin Hills, all these areas being like farmland or orchards wow. or, you know, vineyards, any one, any number of these things. In fact, the LA basin used to be the most productive agricultural sector in the in- entirety of the United States. We also used to have the largest grizzly bears before people settled here. Oh, in addition wow. to, yeah, in addition to that, it is, you know, has one of the most rich ice age faunal histories of any American city. I mean, the whole city is built on fossils in a way that really very few other American cities even come close. Like maybe Northern Denver might barely wow. touch it, but you know, you could be anywhere. They found uh, fossil whale skeletons from 3 million years ago, building giant skyscrapers in Los Angeles. Wow. Can you imagine digging up a fossil whale surrounded by skyscrapers and the sound of traffic that's la i mean when i was working in burbank we excavated a uh, privy feature which is an outhouse from the early 1900s and just think about that like this is where the freeway is is where a giant multi-use complex is going up where a bunch of yuppies will go and stay yeah. laundering their money los angeles real estate whatever comes first uh-huh. um before that, there was a World War II veteran there who chucked his naval cigarette case from the war into the privy for God knows what reason. And then we end up digging it up. There's that kind of archaeological history. And just below that, you go a little deeper, you'll find, you know, Barstovian era fossils. So that's, you know, Pleistocene era, you know. There's entire geological eras named after Southern California. You know, we have the Delan- Rancho La Brain. We have the, uh, which is famous for Smilodon Californicus. I'm sure you guys have heard of, uh, you know, uh, the La Brea tar pits and everything. You know, so when, not- when people people ask me if I have ever been to LA or, or like what I would do in LA, I say, I want to go to the La Brea tar pits. That's the thing I want to exactly. see most. Yeah. They're like, wait, what? What are you talking about? Yeah. So there is, you know, <laughs> It's amazing. The, the big fauna would get stuck and then the predators would go after them. They all get stuck. And then they're fossilized. <laughs> it's just the coolest. Like, uh, you know, the, the, the bones we find at the Brea, the tar is so good at preserving these fossils that they're not even fossilized. They're still the same wow. biological material as the living animal. Yeah, wow. the stuff we find in the Brea, is, it's mind-blowing. And to this day, animals are still getting preserved in there you'll find squirrels you probably have a few house cats you know maybe even a dog somewhere in the tar pits you know anybody who works there can tell you that and it, it's great you see so many different people learning about you know paleontology and learning about you know their city and i think la takes a certain pride in paleontology that you don't really see in other american cities. like if you go down to the promenade in santa monica like there's dinosaurs everywhere and, you know, there's there's fossils all over Los Angeles. You can go down to Palos Verdes and you can go and find megalodon teeth. It, it, it's really nuts. You, you can even find dinosaurs if you go down to Camp Pendleton. Wow. Where do, where do you live in L.A.? So <laughs> I live in Hollywood. Uh, I live in the same neighborhood as, uh, you know, Paramount Pictures. So Dr. Phil films his show in my neighborhood. So whenever you think of my neighborhood, dr phil wow there's so much going on over there tim james going hollywood on us <laughs> i hope not i mean i might end up pissing off the hollywood guys and moving to phoenix arizona because i might be completely out of my mind <laughs> but uh, <laughs> i might be a masochist i don't know if i go to phoenix probably but uh i had some very productive meetings with the arizona museum of natural history so that Maybe, maybe you might see me move there. I can afford a one bedroom in Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we're catching you before you go on uh, a two week or two month expedition. So I just did 10 days straight and I'm about okay. to do another uh, stretch. Yeah. So we're going to okay. be working field camping, a very remote area. You can only reach it with like UTVs or horses and, yeah, we're going to be working for 10 days straight. I don't know if I'll have service or not. So, uh, yeah, I may, may be off the grid for a while, but yeah. we're going to be covering uh, 
you know, a few hundred miles uh, mapping out different archaeological features in the landscape, ma mapping out different pueblos, you know, grinding stones, metates, you know, different biface fragments, which is just a funny way of saying a uh, archaeological flake from flint mapping that has been worked on both sides. Um, you know, mapping out monos, which is just, you know, a grinding stone for working on a matate and, you know, mapping out petroglyphs, which is my personal favorite part because you get to draw out the petroglyph. And when Wait, drawing, tell me more about this. Yeah. Yeah. So we found some really fascinating, you know, well-preserved petroglyphs that had not been really seen since the people left this, you know, area. It's possible that they belong to the Yavapai culture. So the petroglyphs is, are like in, they're like, like sculptures within cliffs or, or, uh, so, or no, we, drawings. They're like drawings, right? Or they're like drawings. So imagine okay. a rock, uh, you know, you take a rock out to the sidewalk and then you start scraping it, right? You start yeah. grinding it. And, you almost you almost can draw with the rock on the on the sidewalk, right? Right. It's a very similar thing. So these indigenous peoples would take rocks and then they would grind on a surface like, you know, an exposed uh, you know basalt outcrop or something where there would be water or where there was burials or uh, an area of religious significance, an area of spiritual significance, an area that had maybe unsafe, you know inhabitants or safe people an area that had water or didn't have water you know any number of things an area they would even depict the area's wildlife and basically they would just notch on the rock and uh you know they try to break the patina of the rock mm -hmm. to expose the actual surface of the rock and by breaking the patina by by kind of etching it out they're able to draw and so whenever you go to different parts of the Southwest, you'll be able to see petroglyphs like in Albuquerque, they have Petroglyph National Monument just on the west side of the city. Uh, pretty much anywhere you go in the Southwest, you're going to be able to find petroglyphs. In fact, I know there's areas around Chicago that have petroglyphs um, right by some of the Mississippian mound builder cultures. So the Cahokia? Field. Yeah. Have you been there? I have, yeah. So what's I it? What's it like? I want to make a trip out there. You know, if you don't know much about what you're looking at, it's not going to look like much. It's just going to look like mounds. But if you know what you're looking at, it's going to be really cool. So I recommend going to check it out. Okay. I'm in Cahokia, but I've been to some Cahokian mounds that are in Illinois. Yeah, Is there's there there's this whole civilization in the Mississippi uh, Valley here, right? Oh yeah. In fact, a lot of indigenous tribes can trace their ancestry to around the Chicago area. In fact, that's where the Lakota people and a lot of the Plains Indians originally lived was in the Great Lakes region. So really? you guys have a fascinating, you know, archaeological history that's a very underwritten, in my opinion, very understudied. Wow. Interesting. So you you recently uh, you can follow uh, Tim on Instagram. It's uh at Dino Guy 1997, right? Yeah. Yeah. So recently you, you posted one of these petroglyphs, right? What was that? You, recently you posted one of these petroglyphs that you found. I did, yeah. How, how old is that? Well, um, I'm actually still familiarizing myself with uh, some of the indigenous histories here in Arizona. Petroglyphs are a little difficult to date because you kind of need to look at the whole representation of the site because you know this was what well, where we found the petroglyphs was a water source in arizona so mm -hmm. people had probably been coming to this water source since there were people living in the prescott region and because this was kind of think about the area where we're working as kind of the netherlands so there was multiple complex cultures all around this oh, area wow. this area wasn't really inhabited it was just kind of people went through it so it's kind of like a highway almost really uh, or a trade post and so the stuff we find is from many different cultures uh you know and it's from many different localities in different regions what's so, what's the name of the area you're in you said water uh, prescott uh prescott national forest in uh, I would call Western Arizona, West Central Arizona. Yeah, I'm looking up the map now. 
Yeah, it's very understudied, this whole region. So how much, this, this is a, not a great question. How much do we not know about like indigenous cultures in the Southwest? Um, everything. Uh, we're just barely starting to have a view of these people that is actually what I would call human. Um, a lot of the okay. times archaeologists and anthropologists in the past, including the general public, maybe due to lack of education, maybe due, of, due to bias, uh, you know, thinking that you live in a society that's so-called civilized, so you know yeah. that these people who are less stratified than you are less, you know, successful or or whatever you know yeah. all of those ideas are starting to change but we still have so much more to actually uncover and learn from so one of the reasons we're trying to make strides and we have been making strides in the last 20 years or since i got into southwestern archaeology is because we've been we've begun to uh you know combine a lot of in, uh, indigenous perspective onto the work that we're doing so okay. now we have different insights on what some of the tools may have been used for. We have oral histories that help us understand what some of the petroglyphs might have meant. We have stories about the Pueblo Revolt that are passed down from generations. We have stories about, you know, living in pit houses and moving from pit, pit houses to above ground structures during the Pueblo One period with Chaco. You know, all of these things have an indigenous history to it, an indigenous account. And we as archaeologists are just barely starting to scratch the surface and in involving, you know, tribal members into these studies. Yeah. Uh, on Instagram, I had an example of this happen right away. So I didn't know what some of these petroglyphs that I uncover meant. But now I do know that some of them mean that there was friendly people in the area that, and there okay. was also water in the area. And that's because a friend of mine who's a paleontologist and an indigenous member of the uh, Jemez tribe uh, in the Jemez Pueblo in New Mexico actually shared his perspective on what some of those, uh, you know, different uh, features meant in the landscape. And yeah, I'm looking at your post right now in the comments. Yeah. yeah. And so that's an example of how, you know, we as archaeologists are starting to uh, utilize collaboration instead of competition to okay. uh you know develop our current understanding of indigenous peoples in the southwest do you think that's been a kind of a recent thing more collaboration rather than competition or i think it has been a more recent thing um yeah. you know it's a shame bacher didn't write a arc uh, you know the dinosaur heresies and also write the archaeology heresies because all of the same stuff that, you know, applies to some of the issues with the old garden paleontology applies to archaeology, but tenfold. So you're tenfold. Uh, what's, is that a book? Is that a book you mentioned? Yeah. So I highly recommend reading The Dinosaur Heresies by Dr. Bob Barker. Uh, you know, he's a paleontologist who works at the Morrison Museum of Natural History, as well as, you know, being on the board at the uh, Houston Museum of Natural History. He's one of the most famous paleontologists that's existed. And he's one of the leading experts on uh, Dimetrodon, uh, you know, mm. Morrison Formation, Sauropod Dinosaurs, any number of those things. And he's just been in a ton of documentaries. If you've seen anything about dinosaurs, Dr. Bob has been in it. Wow. So, wow. but his book talks about some of the issues that he noticed as a young scientist you know, trying okay. to research under, you know, for lack of a better term, the old guard of academia. So I'm experiencing some of these similar things. Okay. Uh, he, basically, people have built their legacies and their careers around their understanding of this indigenous event. But the thing about building a legacy in paleontology or archaeology is your legacy is going to be destroyed when you have more data or more avenues of gathering data available. so better yeah. methods better science better science means that some ideas that may were maybe were once considered the primary notion are no longer considered valid for example the ideas of how the dinosaurs went extinct during mm -hmm. Bacher's time this was a very highly contested thing but now everybody kind of accepts the fact that it was the kt mass extinction 
the same way with archaeology, although we've undergone that these these processes pretty much generationally and each generation, they kind of ramp ramp up, you know, okay. more thoroughly. So some of the changes we're seeing, you know, with the current generation of anthropology is we're seeing, you know, undergrads take a little bit more responsibility to do the research themselves. Uh, I think I would describe them as an entrepreneurial scientists, people who are willing to go out and go the extra mile to achieve the results that they need to get. And the way that a lot of archaeologists have spent their career is just kind of skirting by, Mm -hmm. you know, crossing all the T's and dotting all their I's because there hasn't been too many of these scientists. You know, it's kind of being, you know, really criticized and new methods are being put into place that kind of make the old way look like digging in the sand. So, yeah, so we're seeing, you know, people adhere to more stringent reviews. We're also seeing, you know, a greater respect for the religious significance of archaeological sites towards indigenous peoples. You know, it's really been my generation who's been at the forefront of NAGPRA, you know, repatriating all the artifacts in the Southwest collected from burial sites, collected from sacred sites, you know, repatriating the skeletons of these indigenous peoples themselves to the respective tribes that they belong to, you know, having respect for indigenous religions when it comes to study of genetics. Um, Mm all of these things are becoming like more of the forefront. And because of that, I think we're really starting to see archeology span and anthropology evolve. We're also seeing greater female participation in anthropology and archeology span than ever before. And I think that's really because of, you know, so many, you know, inspirational female figures in anthropology like Jane Goodall or people like Mary Anning who inspired some, or even, you know, fictional characters like the paleobotanist from Jurassic Park. Yeah. All of these things kind of inspire young women to get into anthropology and paleontology. And we're really seeing that in archeology span in a very heavy, you know, way. I mean, in my just anecdotal experience, I'd say over 50% of people I work with who are archeologists now identify as female. So I would call that really great progress when, you know, just 20 years ago, this was a field that was kind of an all boys club. Yeah. I, so, so I mentioned to uh, a couple of friends that you were going to come on the show. So they had a few questions. What you mentioned the increase of female participation in the field and, and the, the industry, how, how much does Jurassic Park have to do with that? I think it's had to do a uh, very significant amount. Uh, Indiana Jones to some extent, but Jurassic okay. Park was a was a, kind of a staple for Gen Zers. I mean, we all grew up loving that film. There's a reason why they produced a bunch of remakes for our generation. Yeah. I think it's just something about, you know, some of the cinematography and it really goes to show, you know, how great Spielberg was at its height. Um, yeah. You know, it, it just really made a huge impact on everybody. And I think the scene that makes kind of the impact and the reason why people identify with it so much is, you know, it's when Dr. Grant sees the Brachiosaurus for the first time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it kind of perfectly encapsulates that sense of awe and wonder that we all get every time we see a dinosaur in a museum or we see a long neck and we're like, oh, my God, I can't believe that thing is actually real. Yeah. You know, I capturing that and putting that on the silver screen and showing people, you know, from different backgrounds in those roles really helped us to, uh, you know, expand the science and make it seem fun, make it seem interesting. And I think that's the key to continuing to grow archaeology and paleontology is this subject matter should not be boring. This subject matter should be exciting. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it doesn't need to be monotonous when you're talking about things that have sickle claws this long, or you're talking about an atlatl point that somebody threw into a mammoth heart like, <laughs> a thousand years ago or some crap. Like that, that's cool. Oh man. And the more people you get involved into the field, the more information and data we have to paint this overall picture of what life was and what happened and what what can we do moving forward right 
Exactly. And if you get more people involved in CRM and you make the competition more stringent, then it'll make this, it'll make the skills of these people have to become more developed. You know, that's what mm-hmm. we've seen in paleontology. People complain about not getting jobs in paleontology, but if you're not getting hired to do your craft, the only thing I have to say is get good, get better. Yeah. And I think competition really fosters people becoming the best they can be in archaeology and paleontology. I think lack of competition and having a field that's just too small Mm -hmm. can really, you know, cause people to become complacent. But I don't really think that's going to be an issue for the next, you know, for at least my entire career. I think we're really going to see a renaissance in both archaeology and paleontology. That's awesome. I'm excited about that. Do you identify more as a, a paleontologist or an archaeologist? Or Man, like you know, I would call myself scientific non-binary. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I it's really the day and the project I'm working on. Uh, yeah. you know, my job title in LA is paleontologist, but 90% of my job when I'm monitoring is cultural material. Yeah. I, I kind of consider myself a naturalist. Like, you know, I have an interest in geology. I have an interest in biology as well. I've even gone and tracked, you know, bird nests out in, uh, out in, <laughs> you know, Victorville with my company. So I would consider myself a naturalist similar to, you know, Benjamin Franklin, not that I'm anywhere near that dude, but similar to how they had many interests in the natural sciences. I too have many interests in the natural sciences. Did you, would you ever, uh, no, I don't think you would. I think we talked about this last time. Would you ever have a cabinet of curiosities like the, the naturalists of the 18th century would have? Oh, I mean, I do have a cabinet of curiosities. Like I have a pretty extensive collection of, uh, artifacts and fossils. So I wouldn't, uh, yeah. And I have, I have like antlers I've picked up in four different states, you know, I've, yeah. I've oh, man, it's cool. skin pelts from like North Dakota and stuff. And I got, I got the total old West collection. Can, can you just briefly list the range of items that you find when you go on these digs? Um, I mean, it's different for every dig, uh, but the range of items that I've been working on in my current project We found wagon skeletons from the 1800s. Really amazing to see that. Uh, I found a canteen from World War II, a veteran from World War II who had left his canteen in the middle of the desert, probably when he was fixing fences or something after the war. Um, And then we found archaic artifacts from 9,000 years ago, archaic points, you know, we'll find different types of pottery shirts littering the surface of the ground. I mean, we found so many lithics, you know, just flakes from somebody flint napping that we had to call it a lithic landscape. I'm talking tens of thousands of flakes everywhere. We found these grinding stones. So we call them boulder matates. What happened is, you know, these indigenous people who had been cultivating corn during the summer months would grind you know, into the rock and it would cause these grooves that are only caused by, and, you know, you would find these anywhere that there would be heavy, you know, occupation. We've found field houses. I think the largest field house we found was five rooms and that's a basically a early Pueblo structure. You know, we found cave structures that had artifacts inside and, you know, indigenous writing inside the caves, you know, different petroglyphs. You know, we found cowboy artifacts, stuff from like, you know, the early 1900s. I mean, tobacco tins from an Arizona Ranger or something. Amazing things. You know, uh, we haven't found too much historical stuff on this property. Most of the stuff we've found has been prehistoric. Um, and as a result of that, everything we found is pristine. So the fact that I found petroglyphs on a like isolated rock that wasn't part of the rest of the hillside, most of those are in like Solvabee's collections. Most of those artifacts and like indigenous pieces are yeah. in art museums or in some like Saudi billionaire's basement yeah. or in their Arizona small towns like wow. garden not you don't see them in the field so the fact that we found not one two and one site 
shows that this site has never been touched. I mean, the archaeologist I was working with, Alan Bartholomew, huge fan of his work. You guys should look up him on Google Scholar, by the way. He's been working in Arizona for his whole life, and he's seen four, four petroglyphs in isolated rocks. Wow. Two of them were on one site that we worked on. So, yeah, it's, That's it's a- been amazing. We found uh, we found obsidian that's been trafficked from New Mexico, probably, and you know it, it's a fascinating archaeology. It's fat. It's a fascinating area to get to work, and I've seen about seven rattlesnakes, a few wow. scorpions. What do you do? What do you do when you come across a rattlesnake? Um, you you back off. <laughs> <laughs> If it's a baby rattlesnake in your camp, you shoot it in the face. <laughs> I did do that a few times. And you don't waste it. So you shoot in the face and you go and you get your knife and you cut its head off. And then you go and, you know, you get some lemon and some butter and you put it in tin foil. Then you flay the snake and then you cook the snake. No uh, way. Then, then, do you really do that? And then you put it. Did that in Wyoming years ago. Ah, <laughs> uh, the life of Tim James. This is this is uh, oh, yeah, living the dream. Uh, yeah, I have rattlesnake in the field, and then the next day I'll go back into LA and go get Nobu, Nobu sushi in fucking Malibu or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, this is incredible. Um, a couple of questions I get typically from people that don't that are that know I'm interested in fossils and stuff are where do you find fossils and how do they, how do the dinosaurs go extinct? If you could give your perspective on that. So we find fossils anywhere um, where the geologic formations, where those animals lived is exposed. So think of layers of geology on the earth, like layers of the book. So in order to read a certain chapter, we have to go to where those pages are exposed. And those pages are exposed in places like Badlands. So if you go to Petroglyph National Monument, or not not Petroglyph, if you go to Petrified Forest National Park in Arizona, or if you go to Teddy Roosevelt National Park in, uh, you know, North Dakota or Badlands National Park in South Dakota, or in even some parts of Yellowstone National Park, you'll see these areas of land that don't have anything growing on it. They're just kind of dead and it's beautiful, just layers of earth that are exposed. And these are more than just pretty layers of rock or layers of dirt. They're actually remains of different biomes and environments that have been preserved over time. So what paleontologists do is we'll identify how old those areas are and we'll identify them as a formation, a geologic formation, Then we'll look at the different layers within the formation and identify those as members. And once we're able to identify the geologic formation and the fossil bearing members within that geologic formation, then we can hike around the wilderness and actually look for, uh, you know, different layers that may tell me that, you know, oh, there was a pond or, oh, this was a certain, this was a low energy depositional environment, like a river channel and stuff. Something like that would be very good for preserving articulated associated sites, which is what paleontologists are looking for is a skeleton, not necessarily just a bone. Um, So we'll go to one of these areas and I'll see a bone eroding down from the hill and then I'll chase it up to the altitude where that bone is eroding out. I'll dig around and I'll determine the altitude. I'll mark the altitude on my notes. And if I find more fossils within three foot three feet of anywhere where that exposed bone is, then I'll continue to excavate and three feet around each each one, each new bone that I find in that little quarry until I have a dinosaur quarry. Now, most of the time you'll find one bone or maybe you'll find three bones, but every now and then you'll get lucky and you'll find a skeleton. And that is when things really get exciting. So that's one of the ways that paleontologists find fossils. It's a lot of hiking. It's a lot of looking at the ground, picking up rocks. We'll lick rocks and bones all the time. If your tongue's to it, it's a bone because bones are porous. 
if, it, if your tongue doesn't stick to it, then it's likely a naturally occurring rock or petrified wood because petrified wood is not porous. Um, you know, it's funny. It, that's really the, the extent of our methods, you know, when it comes to actually finding this material. It's really background research and knowing where to look. You know, other ways that we find stuff is construction monitoring. That's when you build something and you have to dig. So sometimes you'll be building a skyscraper like in Denver, around northern Denver, or you'll be building the Denver airport. You come across a dinosaur bone bed. These things can happen. That They did happen. In fact, under one of the parking garages, I have it on good authority that there is a massive bone bed. Oh, I'm wow. supposed to tell y'all, but I'm <laughs> paid internship. So that's, <laughs> that's what they get. Um, yeah, it, it's paleontology is really interesting. And uh, your other question was how the dinosaurs went extinct. Yeah, people are always curious about that. Yeah, so not all the dinosaurs lived at the same time. We have to remember that there was multiple extinctions going on within the Mesozoic era. So the dinosaurs that we see in the Triassic are not the same dinosaurs that we see in the, you know, Companion period or the Terminal Cretaceous period. Um, you know, this is because within the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous period, there were multiple mini extinctions within all of those periods. You know, the everything goes extinct, including us someday, hopefully, if we're lucky, we don't become the invasive species of the universe, but that's a conversation for him. <laughs> um, basically, uh, there's more time. We're actually closer in time, us humans, to T-Rex than T-Rex is to Triceratops, uh, not Triceratops, than T-Rex is to Stegosaurus or Potosaurus. That's how much time there is in yeah. between different eras you know, that the dinosaurs lived in. Now, the end of the Cretaceous period was caused by a massive asteroid striking in Chicxulub, Mexico, which is off the coast of what is today the modern day Yucatan. Now, the reason why this was such a catastrophic extinction had a few different factors. One of those factors is this asteroid hit onto an area that was basically very fragile limestone that had tons of sulfur and also had other volatile poisonous compounds. So uh. because of the particular place that the asteroid landed on the Earth's surface and on the Earth's crust, it actually caused more um, iridium, more sulfur, and more just general nastiness to be spewed into the Earth's atmosphere than it would have if it crashed into somewhere else. Interesting. Um, I, see, I didn't even... People don't know I knew that. the debris went up. I didn't know it was specific like that. Wow. You, know, you have to be a special type of stoner nerd to know something like that. And that <laughs> so something like, so that happened. And what happened was it caused the dinosaurs were not killed by the ex explosion. There definitely were some who were oh. pretty much <laughs> were living in southern Laramidia, I'm sure got murked. But um, you know, not all of them were killed by the explosion. A lot of people might not know that either. They were actually killed by the starvation that followed. So the asteroid striking the Earth's surface blotted out the sun. Now, first, the blotted out sun ended up killing all the plant life. And so the loss of the plant life meant that the larger herbivorous dinosaurs that required, that relied on massive amounts of plant life to sustain itself. We're talking Earth was about, you know, 30 to 40 degrees warmer than it is now. And there was no polar ice caps. We're talking rainforests on Antarctica. And if there's rainforest in our, in Antarctica, just imagine how fertile Utah and Arizona and the rest of the United States would have been. So these are animals that went from living somewhere that would have made Florida look like a desert today to living in an actual barren wasteland desert, and they could not sustain themselves. So uh, first, the large herbivorous dinosaurs go. So this actually means that Cretaceous, you know, ter like Tyrannosaurus probably lived for a short time afterwards. Who knows how many you know, hundreds of thousands of years, even it may have taken for all these animals to go extinct, or even if it happened in a very like quick time frame, we don't really know because all mm. we have is layers in the dirt, right? Yeah. I'm sure people who do know those people were better at chemistry. I'm not one of those people. Uh, I like my bones. Um, anyway, 
this killed all of the tyrannosaur dinosaurs and all of the carnivorous dinosaurs when there was no more animals for them to eat, not, nothing more for them to scavenge. Pretty much the only thing that were left were little dr- dromaeosaur dinosaurs, animals that could survive off of animals that could also survive eating tubers, you know, roots. So animals that, you know, eventually became modern mammals and modern birds today. Those are the ones that survived. I mean, crocodiles that survived, alligators survived, stingrays survived. Many, many animals did survive the KT mass extinction. But like every mass extinction, the larger and more specialized you were, the more likely you were to go extinct, which unfortunately meant that the very large and very specialized dinosaurs almost went extinct across the board. So that's yeah. kind of what happened with them. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's so fascinating. I love that. <laughs> well, thanks, man. So I do have, I have this, uh, I have this 50 before 50 list in my life that I'm trying to do. And uh, one of the items on here is really like, what would that be? I think, I think it's like 10 items. I want to check out the certain paleontology sites in the U.S. So I have the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry, Quarry, uh, La Brea Tar Pits, Dinosaur Valley State Park in Glen Rose, Texas, uh, cool. Nash Dinosaur Track Site in uh, South Hadley, Massachusetts, Petrified Forest, Arizona, uh, Fossil Butte Monument, Wyoming, Dinosaur Ridge, Morrison, I've been to that one, Denver, Dinosaur State Denver, Park, awesome. Rocky Hill, Connecticut, and then Dinosaur National Monument in Utah, I've been to. Anything else I should add to that list? Yeah, Asheville Fossil Beds in Nebraska. What happened was Yellowstone Super Volcano er- erupted and it blanketed all of the West in ash. So you have perfectly preserved rhinos, subarachidons that mm-hmm. died and got articulated, that preserved so perfectly articulated that you have a mother rhino skeleton like from beautifully preserved, like no disruption in the skeleton at all. It looks like you would have just peeled the meat off the animal. And then inside the womb, you have another baby preserved rhino inside. Wow. That's how good Asheville Fossil Beds is. People are sleeping on how cool that site is in Nebraska. That site's awesome. Mammoth site in South Dakota, Hot Springs. That's a must. I've been to that one. Yeah, I've been to that one. That was Mammoth great. Is- oh, yes. Mammoth site's dope. Clayton Dinosaur Tracks in New Mexico. I would recommend those. Uh, let's see for fossils. And the Waco Mammoth Site in Texas. That's another big one. And if you're ever in Tennessee, the um, there's a site uh, in East Tennessee, uh, the gray fossil beds where they find, you know, American red pandas. And all sorts of crazy fossils that would blow your mind. They find literally they find millions of rodent fossils in this little area. Like they're only able to excavate like two square feet every summer. They find so many like exquisitely pre- preserved fossils. And that's the gray fossil bed site in, in Tennessee. There's tons though. I mean, there's tons, even in the East coast, like people, people don't even understand. Like I would recommend going you rip drid hunting in, you know, Chicago, uh, not Chicago and New York sometime or going fossil hunting into Cleveland shale. That's not too far from you. You can find Dunkleosties or you can go to some of the shales around Chicago and find Tully monsters and crazy yeah, Tully monsters. Yeah. That you can't even, that look like something out of a Rick and Morty episode. Uh, explain the Tully monster, the story behind that. I can't. I'm a vertebrate paleontologist. Um, <laughs> Not too much about the that. Tully monster, except that it's extraordinarily weird. <laughs> it's the state fossil of Illinois. It's a pretty dope fossil. You've been anyway, to Dinosaur National Monument? I have been. When I was like eight years old, I went there. That place is so cool. Oh, it's it's amazing. They have an articulated sauropod neck. Uh, yeah. It's it's unlike anything I've ever seen in my life. I love Dinosaur National Monument. Do Cleveland. you have a... F- oh, go ahead. What were you saying? Do you have a favorite fossil site? Oh, man. That's really a tough one. Uh, God. 
favorite place. That, I mean, I really like working in Faith, South Dakota, up in Hell Creek, just because every time, every ten minutes, you'll find a T Rex tooth. That's pretty awesome. But um, favorite place to just kind of like excavate, probably where I cut my teeth on paleontology at the Wyoming Dinosaur Center. So if you ever end up going there, you can actually go and dig up long neck dinosaurs as a visitor. Wow. So I would recommend that museum. <laughs> That's my favorite. They have, uh, they have the FS quarry, which stands for foot site because they found a perfectly articulated Camarasaurus foot preserved in the ground. Amazing. Really? Oh, yeah. They have Allosaurus fragilis bones. That was the first dinosaur I ever worked on. They have Camarasaurus bones. They have Apatosaurus bones, all sorts of long necks. Anybody from any, they have people from all over the world who go there and dig. I mean, when I was an intern, I once led a tour with a family from Milan. I led it completely over Google Translate and I taught kids how to dig up dinosaurs and look for fossils without even speaking Italian. So that place is just awesome. Wow. Like, you know, the, the beauty of the fossils speak for themselves. So if, and if also that town has naturally occurring hot springs and the biggest hot springs on earth, it's about an hour outside of Yellowstone. So if you haven't been there, you're doing yourself a disservice. Wow. So many places in America to go find fossils and be interested in science. Oh, that's, yeah. And that's just America. That's not even counting Lyme Regis and the U.S., uh, not the U.S., in the U.K. Or, or like, you know, the Solenhof and Quarry in Germany or some of the fossils they're finding in the Zhejiang province in China. You know, some of the beautiful, you know, feather preservation, the Karoo Basin in South Africa or Patagonia and, or Madagascar. Any it, like all over the world, paleontology is still growing and you know ours is developed here but paleontologists i think in the u.s have to branch out to other countries to help them develop theirs because you know in places like madagascar they're seeing their first generation of paleontologists ever oh wow park you're seeing this in china you're seeing this in japan they're like they're, like 10 years ago there wasn't a single person who knew how to work on fossils in japan now they have a dinosaur museum like China is opening up billions and billions and billions of dollars worth of massive museums that make the American museum look like a shoebox. Wow. Yeah. You were seeing other countries like, you know, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan starting to invest in natural history. The United Arab Emirates is starting to invest in their natural history. It's amazing. It's amazing. Like we're going to see a real renaissance of people all over the globe studying this, this science. It's, it, and it's really the responsible, responsibility of Western researchers to help bring these people, you know, into the same level as our current stratified science is. It's, it's up to us to share our knowledge to, you know, uh, help build up these other communities to have more pride in their own cumulative natural history. Because the more people we have working in the field and, and in their areas, the more we all learn together. Exactly. Yeah. The fossils belong to all of humanity. Yeah. Like paleontology belongs to all of humanity. It's how we unite ourselves as a culture. You know, they did, a, yeah. they, uh, they published a uh, study in 2016 where they went over Democrats and Republicans right during the election. They went over everybody and they tried to see just what people could agree on. <laughs> Love dinosaurs was pretty much the only thing that, you could agree on either way. Like, and for me, you know, when I see that, I see, you know, a great chance to unite people under a common banner of curiosity. And, you know, I think that that extends to every language and every culture and every religion. You know, I, I think you can be whoever you are and, and still, you know, it's up to us as scientists to ignite your curiosity. Wow. It's That's to, you to maintain it. That's beautiful. On that note, I think that's a wrap. That was beautiful. I would say so, yeah. <laughs> well, again, Tim James, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate this. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of your channel. I think you're doing really great things. Shout out to all your fans. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me on, Rich. We'll have to do this again. You'll have to come. Absolutely. And 
someday. I know. I want to come out on the field with you someday, for sure. Oh, you totally have to, man. <laughs> One of these days we'll get out there. But anyway, oh, man, yeah. you have a wonderful day, man. Uh, I got to go get back out there and do some Indiana Jones shit. I'm sure you got to go do whatever your Chicago thing is. So That's right. All right. Well, thanks again. Yeah, have a good one. Bye.